the storyteller at fault. At the time when Tua de Danann held sovereignty of Ireland, there reigned in Leinster a king who was remarkably fond of hearing stories. Like the other princes and chieftains of the island, he had a favorite storyteller who held a large estate from his majesty on the condition of telling him a new story every night of his life before he went to sleep. Many indeed were the stories he knew, so many that he had already reached a good old age without failing in even a single night in his task. And such was the skill he displayed that whatever cares of state or other annoyances that might prey upon the monarch's mind, the storyteller was sure to send him to sleep. <sighs> One morning, the storyteller arose early, and as was his custom, strolled out into the garden, turning over in his mind incidents which he might weave into his story for the king that night. But this morning, he found himself quite at fault. After pacing his whole domain, he returned to his house without being able to think of anything new or strange. He found no difficulty in, there once was a king who had three sons, or one day, the king of all Ireland. But further than that, he could not get. At length, he went to breakfast and found his wife much perplexed at his delay. Why don't you come to breakfast, my dear? said she. I have no mind to eat anything, replied the storyteller. Long as I have been in the service of the King of Leinster, I have never sat down to a breakfast without having a new story ready for the evening. But this morning, my mind is quite shut up, and I don't know what to do. I might as well lie down and die at once. I'll be disgraced forever this evening when the king calls for his storyteller. Just at this moment, the lady looked out of the window. Do you see that black thing at the end of the field? Said she. I do, replied her husband. They drew nigh and saw a miserable old looking man lying on the ground with a wooden leg placed beside him. Who are you, my good man? asked the storyteller. Oh, then it is little matter who I am. I am a poor, old, lame, decrepit, miserable creature sitting down here to rest a while. And what are you doing with that box and dice I see in your hand? I am waiting here to see if anyone will play a game with me," replied the beggar man. Play with you? Why, what has an old man like you to play for? I have one hundred pieces of silver in this leathern purse, replied the old man. You may as well play with him, said the storyteller's wife, and perhaps you'll have something to tell the king. In the evening, a smooth stone was placed between them, and upon it they cast their throws. It was but a little while, and the storyteller lost every penny of his money. Much good it may do you, friend, said he. What better hap could I look for, fool that I am? Will you play again? asked the old man. Don't be talking, man. You have all my money. Haven't you? Chariot and horses and hounds? Well, what of them? I'll stake all the money I have against thine. Nonsense, man. Do you think for all the money in Ireland I'd run risk of seeing my lady tramp home on foot Maybe you'd win, said the stranger. Maybe I wouldn't, said the storyteller. 
play with them, husband, said his wife. I don't mind walking if you do, love. I never refused you before, said the storyteller. And I won't do so now. Down he sat, and in one throw lost houses, hounds, and chariot. Will you play again? Asked the beggar man. Are you making a game of me, man? What else have I to stake? I'll stake all my winnings against your wife, said the old man. The storyteller turned away in silence, but his wife stopped him. Accept his offer, said she. This is the third time, and who knows what luck you may have. You'll surely win now. They played again, and the storyteller lost. No sooner had he done so than to his sorrow and surprise, his wife went and sat near the ugly old beggar man. Is this the way you're leaving me? said the storyteller. Sure, I was one, said she. You would not cheat the poor man, would you? Have you any more to stake? asked the old man. You know very well I have not, replied the storyteller. I'll stake the whole now, wife and all, against your own self, said the man. Again they played, and again the storyteller lost. Well, here I am, and what do you want with me? I'll soon let you know, said the old man, and he took from his pocket a long cord and wand. Now, said he to the storyteller, what kind of animal would you rather be? A deer, a fox, or a hare? You have your choice now, but you may not have it later. To make a long story short, the storyteller made his choice of a hare, and the old man threw the cord around him and struck him with the wand, and lo, a long-eared, frisking hare was skipping and jumping on the green. But it wasn't for long who but his wife called the hounds and set them on him. The hare fled and the dogs followed. Round the field ran a high wall, so that run as he might, he couldn't get out. And mightily diverted were beggar and lady to see him twist and double. In vain did he take refuge with his wife. She kicked him back again to the hounds, until, at length, the beggar stopped the hounds, and with a stroke of the wand, panting and breathless, the storyteller stood before them again. And how did you like the sport? said the beggar. It might be sport to others, replied the storyteller, looking at his wife. For my part, I could well put up with the loss of it. Would it be too much, he went on to the beggar, to know who you are at all, or where you come from, or why you take pleasure in plaguing an old man like me? Oh, replied the stranger. I am an odd kind of good for little fellow, one day poor, another day rich. But if you wish to know more about me or my habits, come with me, and perhaps I may show you more than you would make out if you went alone. I am not my own master to go or stay, <sighs> said the storyteller with a sigh. The stranger put one hand into his wallet and drew out of it before their eyes a well-looking middle-aged man to whom he spoke as follows. By all you heard and saw since I put you in my wallet, take charge of this lady and carriage and horses and have them ready for me 
whenever I want them. Scarcely had he said those words when all vanished. And the storyteller found himself at Fox's Ford, near the castle of Red Hugh O'Donnell. He could see all, but none could see him. O'Donnell was in his hall, and heaviness of flesh and weariness of spirit were upon him. Go out, said he to his doorkeeper, and see who or what may be coming. The doorkeeper went, and what he saw was a lank gray beggar man, half his sword bared behind his haunch, his two shoes full of cold water from the road sousing about him, the tips of his two ears out through his old hat, his two shoulders out through his scant tattered cloak, and in his hand a green wand of holly. Save you, O'Donnell, said the lank gray beggar man. And likewise, said O'Donnell. Whence come you, and what is your craft? I come from the outmost stream of the earth, from the glens where the white swans glide. A night in Isla, a night in man, and a night on the cold mountainside. It's the great traveler you are, said O'Donnell. Maybe you've learned something on the road. I am a juggler, said the lank gray beggar man. And for five pieces of silver, you shall see a trick of mine. You shall have them, said O'Donnell. And the lank gray beggar man took three small straws and placed them in his hand. The middle one, said he, I'll blow away, and the other two I'll leave. Thou canst not do it, said one and all. But the lank gray beggar man put a finger on either outside straw, and whiff, away he blew the middle one. Tis a good trick, said O'Donnell, and he paid him his five pieces of silver. For half the money, said one of the chief's lads, I'll do the same trick. Take him at his word, O'Donnell. The lad put the three straws in his hand and a finger on either outside straw, and he blew. And what happened? <gasps> but the fist was blown away with the straw. <gasps> thou art sore, and thou wilt be sorer, said O'Donnell. Six more pieces, O'Donnell, and I'll do another trick for thee said the lank gray beggar man. Six thou shalt have. Seest thou my two ears? One I'll move, but not the other. Tis easy enough to see them. They're big enough. But thou canst never move one ear, and not move two together. The lank gray beggar man put his hand to his ear and gave it a pull. O'Donnell laughed and paid him the six pieces. Call that a trick, said the fistless lad. Anyone can do that. And so saying, he put up his hand and pulled his ear. And what happened was, he pulled away ear and head. Sore thou art, and sore thou be, said O'Donnell. Well, O'Donnell, said the lank gray beggar man. Strange are the tricks I've shown thee, but I'll show thee a stranger one yet for the same money. Thou hast my word for it, said O'Donnell. With that, the lank gray beggar man took a bag from under his armpit, and from out of the bag a ball of silk, and he unwound the ball and flung it slantwise up into the clear blue heavens and it became a ladder. Then he took a hair and placed it upon the thread, and up it ran. Again 
he took out a red-eared hound, and it swiftly ran up after the hare. Now, said the link gray beggar man, has anyone a mind to run after the dog on the course? I will, said a lad of O'Donnell's. Up with you then, said the juggler, but I warn you, if you let my hair be killed, I'll cut off your head when you come down. The lad ran up the thread, and all three soon disappeared. After looking up for a long time, the lank gray baker man said, I'm afraid the hound is eating the hare, and our friend has fallen asleep. Saying this, he began to wind the thread, and down came the lad fast asleep, and down came the red-eared hound, and in his mouth the last morsel of the hare. He struck the lad a stroke with the edge of his sword, and so cast off his head. As for the hound, if he used it no worse, he used it no better. It's little I'm pleased, and sore I'm angered, said O'Donnell, that a hound and lad should be killed at my court. Five pieces of silver, twice over, for each of them, said the juggler, and their heads shall be on them as before. Thou shalt get that, said O'Donnell. Five pieces of silver and five again were paid to him. And lo, the lad had his head, and the hound his. And though they lived in the utmost end of time, the hound would never touch a hare again, and the lad took good care to keep his eyes open. Scarcely had the lank gray beggar man done this when he vanished from out of their sight. No one present could say if he had flown through the air or if the earth had swallowed him up. He moved as wave tumbling or a wave, as whirlwind following whirlwind, as a furious wintry blast, so swiftly, sprucely, cheerily, right proudly, and no stop made until he came to the court of Leinster's king. He gave a cheery light leap, or top of a turret of court and city of Leinster's king. Heavy was the flesh, and weary was the spirit of Leinster's king. T'was the hour he was to hear a story. But send he might right and left, not a jot of tidings about the storyteller he could get. Go to the door, said he to his doorkeeper, and see if a soul is in sight. Who may tell me something about my storyteller? The doorkeeper went, and what he saw was a lank, grey beggar man half his sword bared behind his haunch, his two old shoes full of cold water from the road sousing about him, the tips of his two ears out through his old hat, his two shoulders out through his scant tattered cloak, and in his hand a three-springed harp. What canst thou do? said the doorkeeper. I can play, said the link gray beggar man. Never fear, added he to the storyteller. Thou shalt see all, and not a man shall see thee. When the king heard a harper was outside, he bade him in. It is I that have the best harpers in the five-fifths of Ireland said he, and he signed them to play. They did so, and as they played, the lank gray beggar man listened. Heardst thou ever the like? said the king. Did you ever, O king, hear a cat purring over a bowl of broth, or the buzzing of beetles in the twilight? or a shrill-tongued old woman scolding your head off. 
That I have heard often, said the king. More melodious to me, said the lank gray beggar man, were the worst of these sounds than the sweetest harping of thy harpers. When the harpers heard this, they drew their swords and rushed at him. But instead of striking him, their blows fell on each other. And soon not a man but was cracking his neighbor's skull and getting his own cracked in turn. When the king saw this, he thought it hard the harpers weren't content with murdering their music, but must need to murder each other. Hang the fellow who began it all, said he. And if I can't have a story, let me have peace. Up came the guards and seized the lank gray beggar man, marched him to the gallows and hanged him high and dry. Back they marched to the hall and who should they see but the lank gray beggar man seated on a bench with his mouth to a flagon of ale. Never welcome you in, cried the captain of the guard. Didn't we hang you this minute? And what brings you here? It is me myself, you mean. Who else? said the captain. May your hand turn into a pig's foot when you think of tying the rope. Why should you speak of hanging me? Back they scurried to the gallows, and there hung a king's favorite brother. Back they hurried to the king, who had fallen fast asleep. Please, your majesty, said the captain. We hanged that strolling vagabond, but there he is back again as well as ever. Hang him again, said the king. And off he went to sleep once more. They did as they were told, but what happened was they found the king's chief harper hanging where the lank gray beggar man should have been. The captain of the guard was sorely puzzled. Are you wishful to hang me a third time? Said the lank gray beggar man. Go where you will, said the captain. As fast as you please, you only go far enough. It's trouble enough that you've given us already. Now you're reasonable, said the beggar man. And since you've given up on trying to hang a stranger because he finds fault with your music, I don't mind telling you that if you go back to the gallows, you'll find your friends sitting on the sward, none the worse for what has happened. As he said these words, he vanished, and the storyteller found himself on the spot where they first met, and where his wife still was with her carriage and horses. Now, said the lank gray beggar man, I'll torment you no longer. There's your carriage and your horses and your money and your wife. Do what you please with them. For my carriage and my houses and my hounds, said the storyteller, I thank you. But my wife and my money you may keep. No, said the other. I want neither. And as for your wife, don't think ill of her for what she did. She couldn't help it. Not help it? Not help kicking me into the mouth of my own hounds? Not help casting me off for the sake of a beggarly old... I'm not as beggarly or as old. As ye may think. I am Angus of the Bruff. Many of good turn you've done me with the King of Leinster. This morning, my magic told me the difficulty you were in, and I made up my mind to get you out of it. As for your wife here, the power that changed your body changed her mind. Forget and forgive, as man and wife should do. And now you have a story for the King of Leinster when he calls for one. And with that, he disappeared. It's true enough. He now had a story fit for a king. From first to last, he told all that had befallen him, 
So long and loud laughed the king that he couldn't go to sleep at all. So he told the storyteller never to trouble for fresh stories. But every night, as long as he be lived, he listened again and he laughed afresh at the tale of the link, Grey Baker Man.